Welcome to Meet the Artist. I'm Elizabeth Merton and I'm one of the curators at UH Arts, the Arts and Cultural Programme for the University of Hertfordshire. Today I'm delighted to be talking to Diane McLean, who is a renowned artist known for her large installations on the occasion of giving Diablo to our art collection. Diane's impressive career includes Open Book that was gifted to Paris in 2014 and unveiled by the Queen and is exhibited around the world, including, including places such as Sweden and Canada. Diane is also an alumna and a member of the Court of the University of Hertfordshire. So welcome, Diane. It's just lovely to be talking to you today and thanks so much for, for being with us today. Well, thank you. So first question for you yes. is to tell us a little bit about your practice, um, a little bit about what you make and why and, and what the materials that you use are. Would be. I'm working mostly on public art commissions and I use materials such as stainless steel because they are long lasting. And when you do, when you do work in the public arena, you, you have to be extremely careful with health and safety and also uh, with longevity because you're using public money a lot of the time. And I feel very aware of that. And I think I must do my very best with the money available to make something that's you know, good to look at and also people can enjoy and will last. Um, I make quite a lot of sculptures you can walk through or sit on. I make sculptures also with moving parts, with colour. I'm working with an engineer actually um, to make my sculpture these days. I started off making my own um, mild steel sculptures. So stainless steel is my favourite um, material and it is easy to maintain as well, which is another thing that's always sort of asked for. And it's very versatile. It's very strong. There are different surfaces you can use. You know, you have mirror polished, which is very reflective. There's bright annealed, which is also reflective, but much cheaper to make. And brushed polished, which has a silvery look because it picks up light. And then there's colored stainless steel, which is created by an oxide on the surface of the material and it reacts with light. The color is made by light. And I absolutely love this idea that the color is natural color. And it's the angle of entry of, of the light onto the surface that creates color. And so it changes, you know, for the light of day or with moving around. And we can see that in Diablo, can't we? That lovely- Yes, now that does color. lead up to Diablo because that is colored stainless steel. It's um the, the oxide, can vary. The, the, when the coloured stainless steel is made, it's dipped into a tank for a very, very short time and at, at different temperatures. And, and, and the length of time it's in there and the temperature creates a, a different colour when it's pulled out of the, of the um, liquid. And um, the colours that work best are red and green. And I do not know why, but the red changes colour to a sort of purpley blue, almost golden. And the green goes from purple to blue to a, almost a red color sometimes, depending on the light. Um, the other colors with thinner oxide layers are possible too, but they're not quite so uh, versatile. The sculptural spine, that is colored stainless steel. And it looks, every time I see it, I'm amazed because you know, it gives me a, a surprise when I drive past it because <laughs> it changes color, you know, just as you, as you watch, you know, as you walk past. And it's in Encampment, the other one I'm thinking of. Oh, Encampment, yes, Encampment was, the, that was really how I started making conical sculptures. And the idea, I, I was commissioned by a sculptor at Goodwood, the Cass Foundation, to make a sculpture. And they are made of coloured stainless steel. And of course, because they're angled, the, the form is angled, and also the, the surface is curved, you get a very good variation on the, the colour with this. And that was the, that was the first time I made um, that particular shape and since then I have made several um, conical or pyramidal sculptures because I like this um, geometry in the landscape you know it's like a sort of contrast at the same time it picks up shapes that are there already. The Diablo sculpture really came about when I was I was trying to think about a new idea for a series of exhibitions that I was having in 2018, 2019 and uh, I thought well if I have one, if I put one cone on top of the other, that would be different. And then when I did that, it reminded me of a toy that I had. I think it might have belonged to my grandparents. It was a Diablo toy. You toss 
this sort of diablo shape on a, on a, on a string between two sticks and it's quite difficult to do. Um, but that shape, um, it's, it's sort of interesting that the actual game is just started in China I mean, very, very many years ago and it came back to England, I think in the in 19th century, somebody brought it over to, to Europe and it was quite a popular game for a while. I think in Italian, it means devil. And it comes at the dia and bolo are from Greek, actually, meaning throw across. That sense of playfulness as well. Yes, yeah. playful game and playfulness. Yes, that is the idea. And as you said, a lot of your works, you can kind of, you encourage people to walk through or around or engage in. in yes, I do. Yes, I, I like to make something on a quite a large scale and if possible with some sound or something else going on. Um, the sculpture I made at Natural History Museum, Mountain it's called, I talked to scientists there who are uh, mineralogists. I avoided the dinosaurs because I thought <laughs> every, everybody's going to do dinosaurs. So I went to mineralogy is so fascinating because these people, they're looking at bits, they're looking at the stars and the planets and they're, and they're examining little tiny morsels that could have come off the planet. I found this utterly fascinating and uh, they were very helpful to me. And um, so I had this idea, well, I'm about the, I'm, I'm very interested in the interior of our planet. You know, this is amazing. I, I spend every day, I have to tell you, I must, I spend my life being amazed. And now here am I sitting in my little office with my, my models and a computer. I mean, this is a little, this, we're on a, a, a swirling ball of rock going around in space and no other planet has anything like this. I've been driving with my husband through the mountainous Switzerland and I, while he was driving I was doing you know drawing the tops of the, the, the line of the mountains and so when I came back I thought ah oh, yes I'll do that the outline of the mountains but I'm going to make it in <coughs> sections so that people can actually walk in among these and the scientists lent recordings of the sound of movement in the inside of the planet, you know, of stones rumbling or moving. The scientists let me use images from their computers, which they were of minerals actually, but they, they used color to enhance the, the, the various aspects of it. And so these are quite nice, colorful little images. And then of course, a sponsor came along and very kindly um, paid for my sculpture to be moved to the University of Hertfordshire, which was, just another wonderful happening. Absolutely, and now that sits on our other campus, the, the yes. uh, design campus. Yes, I do like the idea of being connected to a university because of you know all the th thinking that goes on behind the walls. You know, all sorts of surprises come out, and it's uh, until you get in there, you don't know what they are. <laughs> it's, fascinating, isn't it? it's like treasure boxes of ideas and explorations and all these different buildings. Actually, when I did the exhibition at the Natural History Museum, the people who were working on the, the um, I suppose they were astrophysicists at the University of Hertfordshire, they also provided um, images of the work they were doing. They have a huge telescope there and they are looking at you know, space beyond us, the Milky Way and so on. And they provided information so I could make an exhibition inside the museum. And that brings us nicely to um, talk about um, your career in terms of studying at University of Hertfordshire. You'd been working, creating artwork before that, but then you came and, and did a, 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 was it a BA in fine yes. arts? My father was very keen for all his children um, to, to get some kind of qualification, you know, a degree. And my grandfather had been like that too. He had educated all his um, children. My, one of my aunts went to the Slade. In the end, I read uh, French and Spanish at University College. The door at the end of the French department led into the Slade. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I spent three years on the wrong side of the door. Um, but it did feed into my life in the future, because when you study a language, you just don't just get the words, which are always beautiful anyway, but you get a philosophy and you get the literature and you get a history all these things come up in the literature. And I was particularly interested in, in more modern poets, in the um, Sambolist poets, and also in the Spanish uh, poets of Heredia and people like that. Um, and I always think about poetry as being, you know, you use words to build up, rather like in making a sculpture, you're, 
creating something, not in the normal way. Uh, you're not you're taking things out of their context and making something new. And so, so that was a rich beginning. But as soon as I finished my degree, I got married, and my husband's job took us to Africa. And during that time, I was painting because I'd always loved painting and drawing. And so I was painting a lot. I was painting the amazing landscapes and um, you know the different African sort of um, environments. And um, then I, and I started, I did a lot of paintings of people. I quite like painting people. And eventually I started getting commissions. And I managed to get, I painted one, a very attractive person who went to live in Canada. And she then started getting commissions for me in Toronto. And then I started getting commissions in New York. And the wonderful thing about New York was I would have a client, a wealthy client sitting there for several, you know, different sittings but in between the sittings I could walk around the art galleries and the New York art galleries were staggeringly wonderful and I came across contemporary sculpture um, at the time it was um, David Smith uh, whose sculpture he was making sculptures in the landscape using his you know metal whatever he found fences and things and then um, Alexander Calder who was making his move mobiles and stabiles and things and Sarah, who was making enormous steel sculpture. So that stayed in my mind, although at the time I had not thought of making sculpture. Providentially, the, the University of Hertfordshire, it was, it, was it was the Hearts College of Art and Design in St. Albans, which, which is now part of the university. They started a, a part-time degree. And this was the most wonderful change for me. I, I, this was the thing I'd probably been sort of looking for. So what sort of things did you learn that you think have helped shape or helped you on your career journey since, since leaving? Oh, well, absolutely everything, because I had started then using three dimensional materials. We all we learned how to do all the different methods of, of fabricating, you know, like it was we should do clay modelling and, and we could work with wood and with a little bit with stone, not too much with stone and with with steel, with welding. The person who was teaching there, Dave Seaton, was head of sculpture, and he was very keen on welding. He's he's a fan of Cairo, and um, in fact, Cairo did come on a visit to the, the college when I was there. Uh, we had very good tutors coming from uh, Goldsmiths and um, the Royal College. You know, I used to spend a lot of time with the foundation students because they were all welding away, and I did to start with. I used wood. And I used, um, I made suspended things with paper and, um, you know, things that were quite large but were hanging in the air. And then, when I got my hands on the on the steel, though, I realised that I could build up, and you can cut it, and you can. It's very versatile. Uh, so I got scrap steel, and I used to spend my, and, and aluminium as well. I spent my time. Um, you know, working on those. I would say that that is one of the best things that I learned how to use my materials. It's very important. It gives you a freedom. I did do, I actually did a welding course at the at St. Albans College of Building and I did a chainsaw course as well. Graham Boyd was a very inspirational person too. He was the head of the, of the degree. He was uh, in charge of it. He was a painter, but oh, he is a painter and has remained a friend. But um, there is an element of luck in everything. At the end of my degree, I, one of my sculptures was chosen for the New Contemporaries. That's the exhibition that um, students from all the art colleges in Britain, are, they just choose a few. It, it gave me confidence that even though I was by that time just over 40, um, I could then get it, I could do what I wanted to do, you know, survive in the art world. And also it gave me a little bit of publicity and I had a few connections from that. So um, very quickly, my, um, my career grew from that, that moment. Have you got any tips for aspiring artists? Learn how to, to use your tools and materials. And so you, you, you know what you're doing, then you, that is a kind of freedom. And the other thing, the other thing I did was I joined a couple of societies, sort of groups. Now, there was one group, just myself and Barbara Lander, who was the technician at the Hartford City College of Art and Design, who's also a friend. Um, she and I and a few others did 
some exhibitions. We put, we did a little group exhibition. You know, we found places to do it. The other group I joined was the, the Women's Artists Slide Library. And I don't know if that's still going, but I went along to that and I met a Lithuanian artist there. It's just, again, by chance, I was involved in an exhibition. I was helping her to set her, her light sculpture up. And she asked me, she invited me to go to Lithuania with her. Now, this was the start of a whole string of, of um, well, exhibitions and symposiums and other happenings. Uh, if you have any chances to join a group or join a society or meet people, make the most of it because things, one thing leads to another. There's very much a sense of, as well as knowing your materials really well. And, and yes. It's yes. really inspiring to know that you did these extra courses and you sought out specific skills. It's also, it sounds like you were very active and very proactive. To be open to doing something, to land up in a place where you haven't got any tools, you haven't got any materials, and then make something. I, I went to Japan and I didn't have any idea what I was going to do in Japan. Um, and the, I was invited there and they were very nice and they provided, provided accommodation and a bicycle. And um, I walked into the forest and I thought, I'm going to make something hanging and I'm going to make, and I, I'd seen kimonos are just flat really. So I thought I'll make some kimonos hanging in the trees. And I cycled all around the DIY shops and got a whole lot of chain, you know, just ordinary chain, metal chain. And I, can, and I then started um, making the kimonos out of chain and it picks up light, you know, it just hangs nicely. Um, so that was just, you know, inventing on the spot. It's kind of a combination, you, as well as making these kind of really solid um, sculptures that you're very conscious of the materials being yes. built to last. Also going on these different um, symposium, different opportunities to make in response. Yes, to make it, to respond to the place and to be with other artists and hear what they're doing in different countries and things. I mean, wonderful chance. I got lucky again. It sounds amazing so there's lots of different influences you've got the um, yes. kind of your interest in poetry and constructing language and then yes. the in kind of the world the fascination with the world yes um, I think it, it all feeds into the way it's, 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 it's I don't know if it's a way of thinking but it's it's um it makes you think anything's possible sort of Thank you so much for... Um, well, thank you, Elizabeth. I've, I've enjoyed talking to you. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you as well.